What is up, everybody? Welcome back to Broadened Horizon. I am your host, Drake Riggs, bringing you episode five. We've officially had 20 guests, you guys. How about that? Thank you so much, as always, for tuning in. Uh, For episode five, we kick things off in a big way with the winner of Ryzen 25's co-main event, Hiromasa Ugikubo. After Hiromasa, we go to the Rebels kickboxing queen herself, Rina Panchan Okamoto. Next, it will be the young featherweight knockout artist, Kyohei Hagiwara, who scored a 22-second knockout at Ryzen 25 and is turning right around to fight at Ryzen 26. And last but not least, former Ryzen and Bellator bantamweight champion Kyoji Horiguchi joined us before his massive rematch on New Year's Eve at Ryzen 26 against Kai Asakura. Thank you to all of them for joining us. It was another awesome lineup, and thank you to those who submitted questions, which we will always answer at the end of the show. And remember that wherever you're watching or listening, all versions of Broaden Horizon can be found on MyMMANews.com, those versions being video, audio, and Japanese audio. So with that in mind, enough intro. Thank you as always, everybody. Enjoy. And first up, it is the veteran bantamweight contender, Hiromasa Ugikubo. All right. Hey, Hiromasa. Thanks so much for joining me. <laughs> and, you know, big congratulations, of course, on the great win at Ryzen 25. Good to see you back in action. And, you know, before we get talking about the fight and everything, I'm very curious. I'm dying to know the explanation to this. Uh, your last name, Ogikubo, but we see, I've seen it without the U after the O and with the U. So, w- what's the correct spelling of your last name? I'm very curious. <laughs> o O U G I. So, yeah, it's the one with the O U G I is the correct spelling. Okay. Yeah. I was always really confused about that because a lot of, a lot of people I've noticed leave out the U, and I think even on back in the Ultimate Fighter, they left it off for you. I don't know if there any <laughs> reason for that. It was uh, a weird thing. <laughs> so I don't really know how it happened, but uh, I'm assuming that back in the day when I was fighting for Shuto, I think somebody just posted my name on Sherdog without the U, and that's what just kind of went through. And uh, I've always because my passport it, it has it has a U, right? O U. So, but uh, I've always just kind of let it go, just whatever it is. But uh, recently, I tried to, I started to put things together of my life together, and then I thought that uh, I need to get my name right. So I recently requested Sherdog and you know those <clears throat> pages to uh, to make my name with the OU. Yeah, definitely. Got to be accurate with that stuff. I was always so confused, like, which one is it? So <laughs> good to know the actual answer. Now I got to get that U in there. And uh, yeah, seeing that more. So good to know there. But um, yeah, of course, great win against Kenta in your last fight here. Just, uh, you know, this most recent Friday. So man, what's the initial reaction here to, you know, getting the win, rebounding, getting back in the win column, and just your overall feelings of the performance you had? Yeah, so my loss in, uh, in August against uh, Asakura, it wasn't, it was actually very devastating. And uh, it wasn't the way I wanted to perform. I lost in a way where I didn't want it to be like, there was a lot of doubt in myself that built up after that loss. And uh, it, it really hit me hard mentally. And uh, I was almost at a point where I thought that I could never you know, rebound as a fighter again. So there was a lot of doubt in myself and uh, I, I kind of did hit rock bottom. Um, but uh, after all that, um, my most recent fight, I was able to get the win, although it was a decision, but uh, I was able to get that win and I kind of regained confidence again. So uh, in one word, I'm just very relieved. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, the Kai loss, like you mentioned, only your second career loss by knockout. And I mean, for the title too and everything that went into it and rebounding now against Kenta, did that really, it sounds like, you know, it, it made the fight with Kenta here a lot bigger for you because of what happened in the last one and everything. So, I mean, did you feel a lot of pressure going into it because of, you know, what happened in the fight with Kai? So, yeah, I think I fought 28 professional fights in my career so far. But uh, this fight, leading up to this fight, it, it was by far I felt the most pressure uh, leading, in, uh, leading into this fight. And uh, at a point where it, if I lose, I don't deserve to be here anymore. So for me, if I lost this fight, it was all over. Well, you went out there and you performed 
performed very well, obviously. Ended up getting the win and a great third round in particular. It seemed like you got, you know, stronger as the fight went on. Was he was he kind of tricky to figure out at first? Because, you know, he's got a very unusual stance, at least compared to most fighters, I would say. You know, the way he keeps his hands down and everything. Um, did you feel like that was the case where as the fight went on, you were able to figure him out more? And then, of course, heard him in the third round, you know, got on top of him and really just controlled the rest of it from there. Hi, so this is it wasn't that uh, he, he was tricky and hard to figure out, but I was being very conservative in the first round because I knew that he was, he was, he was looking to counter my shots with, with a knee. <clears throat> so I was making sure that I don't run into that knee. So I was, I was being very conservative, and I used the first round to kind of figure him out, study him. And uh, as the round went on, I found out that my jabs and head kicks would, were, were landing. So in the second round, I utilized my jabs and head kicks, which got Takizawa to kind of guard up a little bit. <clears throat> he, he started to utilize his uh, guard more. So that's when I started uh, bringing in some, some shots and takedowns to mix things up. And well, I, I definitely felt that uh, as the fight proceeded, it got easier to, to fight him. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's how it played out. That's for sure. And, you know, I mean, did you do much study on him before? Like, I don't know if you're a guy who does a whole lot of studying on their opponents, like, or you just let your coaches handle it. But, like, did you know much about Kenta going into the fight? And, you know, did anything really surprise you? Or were you pretty well aware of what he had to offer? So I, re I usually don't really, like, study, study my opponents. But I do see some, some footage, and uh, what I try to focus on during those times is that what my opponent eats, like what, <clears throat> where his lack of defenses are. So that's what I try to figure out for, for, my, for all my opponents. And uh, for this one, I kind of felt that Takizawa had a very uh, a weak left guard. So everything, everything on his left side were, were landing, or actually on my left side were landing. That's where I tried to uh, try to capitalize on, and, and it worked out. That it did. Got the hand raised. <laughs> Got the hand raised. So I mean, with all that in mind, are you are you thinking about what could be next already? You're just going to enjoy the end of the year festivities that are coming up here. Or, you know, do you have anything in mind for maybe what you want to who you want to fight next? When next? Or, do you, or are you just chilling out right now? What What are you thinking for the future? <laughs> Um, so right now, I'm not quite sure about New Year's Eve. As of now, the plan is to just chill out and relax the rest of the year. But who never knows, right? Um, but right now, I'm in the middle of moving, as you can see. And that is my biggest uh, thing I have to worry about right now, is moving. Is yeah, moving. definitely. Moving is always a fun little project of sorts. And so, uh, yeah, best, best of luck with the full process there. Are you moving far? How far are you moving from where you were before? <laughs> yeah, uh, he's going to be moving. I'm going to be moving in, within the same city, but uh, not too far. But it's going to be a, a little bigger than where I am right now. Well, there you go. That sounds, sounds nice. So, uh, yeah, very cool. Very cool. And, you know, man, I know that depending on where your mindset was and everything, listening to what you're saying about the Kyle loss, and it, it seems like, you know, if things didn't go your way, of course they did against Kenta here. I mean, could this have been like retirement for you? Are you thinking kind of of the end of, you know, MMA for you? Is that something playing in your mind? Of course, you've had a very long, sex, successful career now, but is, do you see and envision life after MMA at this point? So the thought of after being a professional fighter is always there. I'm not, I'm not that young anymore. My age is getting there. So I think I'm right at a point where I have started to think about that. Yeah, of course. I mean, 
we can't all stay young forever, unfortunately. But uh, you know, still you're you're young in total years. What thirty three? So I mean, fight years, maybe a little older, but that's not too bad, I would say. But uh, yeah, you know, happens eventually. So understandable there. And I mean, as for the past though, and things that have happened in your career, I did want to mention and talk about a little bit the Ishii Watari fight at the end of the year last year, uh, Rising Twenty, because that fight was so awesome. You know, a late fight of the year contender, and you know, you've had a lot of great crazy fights. But I mean, what? Just where does that one rank in terms of your craziest fights that you've had? Because that one was awesome. I just have to ask. <laughs> it would definitely make my top three list, but it's not my, my best. It's not number one. Oh, well, in that case, then, do you, what's number one? I got to know. One is the it's, yeah, it's for, 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 for me, it's the, uh, the fight against uh, Pantoja during the Ultimate Fighter. Yeah, that was a very good one, too. And I mean, just mentioning the Ultimate Fighter, I was talking, talking about it the other day. Or it might have been during the, uh, the intermission stream, actually, that I did. But I mean, the Ultimate Fighter, of course, is going back in time a little bit. And what has happened has happened. But when you initially, the season ended, of course, you fought Tim Elliott in the finals of it, right, to get that title shot. Um, were you surprised that they, you know, didn't bring you still into the UFC anyway? Because usually they will still bring in at least both, you know, a couple people, not just the winner these days. So, and especially at the time for the flyweight division where they kind of needed a bunch of people, um, you know, was that surprising to you that they didn't, didn't offer you anything past the ultimate fighter at the time? Yeah, I, I definitely thought it was weird. Because even after the season ended, I didn't, I didn't get the call, but some of the fighters who, who lost during the season were getting contracts from the UFC, like Eric and, you know, Eric and uh, yeah, Pantoja. Both, both fighters got an offer from the UFC, and I was sitting there like, why am I not getting the call? So it was, it was, it was definitely frustrating for me. Yeah, definitely a bizarre move on their part. And I think probably not the best one considering, you know, you haven't really lost too much since then, have had very good success. And I mean, that was at flyweight too. So just in terms of that, is it, you prefer not to cut weight too. So ultimately, instead of, you know, now you're a bantam weight rather than flyweight. So it's worked out pretty good. Is that fair to say? <laughs> so in, in hindsight, I think uh, it was good for me that I didn't get the offer from the UFC. Because when you look about, when you think about it, I'm sure I would, I would have been able to make some kind of an impression in the UFC. But um, when you look at it, like Japanese fighters barely get two fights a year, maybe one. And um, for me, now, now that I'm thinking about it, like it would be really financially tough for me to live off of one fight per year. So right now, <clears throat> I have been fighting constantly in Ryzen. And uh, I have become much more stable, and uh, I think it's it's a very good thing for me. So I do think it it ended up well that I, I didn't get the offer from the. Yeah, and I mean that's not even factoring in you know potential travel expenses of you know having to go overseas all the time and everything too. So yeah, I hear you there. But um, yeah, just two more things left for you, Hero. Thanks so much for the time, man. But uh, I'm curious. I gotta know as New Year's Eve is coming up. We mentioned New Year's Eve earlier. And then Kai, of course, uh, the rematch with Horiguchi and Asakura, both two guys you're familiar with, you know. So just in terms of predictions and how you see the fight going, I got to know what your opinion is, your take on uh, the big rematch for the title in your division. So personally, I hope that Horiguchi wins. But speaking realistically, I think uh, Asakura is going to win. We'll see what happens. Can't wait to find out. That one's going to be awesome. So, uh, yeah, definitely. We'll all be <laughs> staying tuned for that. But, um, all right, Hiro Masa, I got one last thing for you. Fun question. I try to make the last ones fun for everybody. Um, you know, I know that you know how to play guitar. At least I've seen <laughs> you play guitar on your Instagram and stuff. So, well, do you have a favorite song to play or multiple songs? Is there something that sticks out for, uh, you know, when you're, when you're getting on the guitar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that nobody, no English speaker who, who will understand this, but uh, I'm a big fan of uh, Takuro Yoshida. He's a Japanese uh, singer. And uh, in fact, I use one of his songs for my walkout music. It's called Rakuyo, but 
I, I like to play a lot of his songs. And uh, internationally, I, I like Bob Dylan's music. So I like to play his song too. All right. Very cool. I mean, Bob Dylan, good choice there. And, you know, I don't know the Japanese one, but that's why we have a Japanese version of the show. People will be excited to hear that, I'm sure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Hero, that is all I got for you, man. Um, awesome chatting with you. Awesome win, of course. Congratulations again. And just, uh, you know, big thanks for coming on to chat here. And, uh, you know, arigato gozaimashita. You know, thanks for taking the time, sir. And, you know, good luck with the rest of the moving. And uh, a happy new year to you <laughs> as it's coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. From there, we go to the undefeated kickboxing sensation, Rena Panchan Okamoto. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Rena. Great to get to talk to you. Very excited to, you know, hear your story and everything. And, you know, congratulations, of course, on the big title defense recently. Awesome to see that. So, I mean, first of all, I'm very curious. Rena Panchan, the nickname, the, the origin story. I got to know because I know Panchan, uh, Pan character from dragon ball right is that the origin of the nickname what's the story behind as a child as a child i big uh, dragon ball and uh i liked i did definitely like the character pension and uh before my 20th birthday um, i was having a chat with my friend and she mentioned that you look like pension so as i was uh as i was having my 20th birthday i decided to rename my myself and call myself pension so i actually had that name before i started fighting yeah, it, it works. It fits very well and a, a good character there. Of course, I watched a little bit of Dragon Ball 2 growing up. So fantastic show, of course. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I was curious about that. And so, you know, just for your story in general, I'm very fascinated by it from what I already know and everything. And I want to hear it from your side, of course. Um, but, you know, your early life sounded like you did a lot of swimming, track and field type athletics and whatnot. And, you know, I know that you dropped out of high school, I believe, and, you know, kind of got involved in the nightclub scene a little bit, maybe. But I'm just curious, you know, how did you find combat sports? You know, what exactly is the story that led you to where we are now? If you, if you could tell me. Up until 16 years old, I was, uh, I was an athlete. I was doing sports all my life and being competitive. But uh, after I kind of stopped working out and uh, playing sports at 16, um, I couldn't satisfy myself. Anything I do wouldn't satisfy me. And it was kind of boring. Life became boring and, and stale. So I started uh, at 1920, I started to get myself back into playing sports. And uh, I knew that, you know, sports, I need sports in my life. I need to be in sports. So when I came out to Tokyo at the age of 21, I got myself into like uh, athletic athletic uh, programs. And that's when I was introduced to kickboxing. And at the age of 22, I joined this current gym I, I'm at right now. And I decided to challenge the sport. All right. Very cool. I mean, what was the initial, you know, the meeting of you know, a sport like kickboxing, uh, you know, a very physical sport, obviously, and uh, working with the struggle gym, of course. Um, just what was it like when you initially met? Was it love at first sight for, you know, the sport or did it take some time to kind of adjust? <laughs> So for me, it was a great experience. Um, up until that point, I was never, I would never be praised for anything. People wouldn't give me compliments of anything. So when I first started, uh, people would praise me and, and compliment me for, for my abilities. They'd be like, oh, you're so good for, for your first time. And, you know, people would make me feel good about it. So me being as simple as I, as a simple person I am, uh, you know, felt good on my first time so that's how I, that's how I started and I stuck with it yeah I can imagine that would be a good feeling of course and what were people's reactions like you know outside of the fight scene when they hear like oh what you're fighting now like really like were they surprised when they found out so at, at the time uh, 10 out of 10 people would say that it's not that easy and they wouldn't take me serious and that includes my family so at the very beginning i didn't get any support i'm sure that you know over time you kind of won your family over of course maybe you know nobody wants to see you know their their children you know get hurt or anything like that but 
have they come around a little bit, you know, over time? Yeah, the opinions of my family has changed drastically. Um, I have, they fully support me now. Uh, they come to my fights, they cheer for me. Um, up until my third professional fight, um, they were mostly like, uh, just make sure you don't, you don't hurt yourself, you don't get punched in the face, that, that kind of support. But after, uh, after a few fights, uh, they fully cheer for me to, to go for the win. They want me to accomplish things and uh, they back me 100%. That's awesome. Definitely a big change over time, just getting more comfortable. And especially as you keep winning, it makes sense that they would react that way. So that's very cool to hear and everything. And um, I know that you've also, I don't know if you're still doing it, but I've done modeling before. And if that ever co coexisted with like fighting and, you know, just the difficulties of maybe doing both of those things, because obviously you need to not have black eyes or whatever if you're taking pictures and whatnot. But how, is, how has it been juggling those two things between modeling and fighting? Because I know there's some people who have also done that <laughs> in the past. So uh, I, used to, I used to model before kickboxing back in Osaka. Um, but I, would, I wasn't really taking it seriously. You know? But um, now when I have to, when I do, um, they understand that I'm also a fighter and I might show up with some bruises on my face or whatnot. But uh, the, the makeup artist does a fantastic job. And... Uh, yeah, a lot, a lot of the times, uh, it turns out okay. So they understand, they understand my situation, and the makeup person does a great job. So I'm not having any issues as of now. Of course, that's what they're there for. So <laughs> they got to do their jobs as well. Um, and you know, just for how many fights you've had so far, you know, internet can be a little bit unreliable. So, so you know, sometimes so. Uh, what is it? Six, six and zero oh in kickboxing and three and zero oh in Muay Thai. I mean, just got to get the the specification here on your career so far. Two thousand two shots. Muay Thai was on. If you get a, the the official official record in in Japan would be uh, nine nine fights. I'd be nine and zero oh. um, because uh, all the fights have no they have no. Uh, <clears throat> they have no elbows. They're not like official Muay Thai rules. So he is 9-0 and under Japanese official kickboxing rules. Okay, all right. Just had to see, you know, if there was a preference there between Muay Thai or kickboxing or whatnot. Just get the full story there. So, okay, very interesting. And, you know, I also wanted to ask you if you had like a favorite technique or something because I've noticed from, you know, watching your fights and everything that your front kick is really something you like to use a lot. And it, it's very good. So would you say that's your favorite technique if you have one? Front kicks are definitely uh, they're useful um, because of my height. Whenever I fight, my opponents are usually a lot shorter than me, and my in my previous fights uh, they are all punchers instead of kickers. So when you go against a fighter who's shorter and who's a puncher, that front kick definitely uh, comes in handy, and you can utilize it very well. So a lot of the times my opponents have studied me and tried to try to work on their game plan, but uh, that front kick definitely throws them off of their game plan. And plus, I just don't want them to shoot in and uh, in, in a close range fight. So yes, I do. I do like to utilize my front kick a lot. Yeah, it definitely comes in handy in those situations. So uh, <laughs> you throw it very well. So I just had to bring that up specifically. And, you know, of course, as I mentioned earlier, you know, congratulations on the win over Mari earlier this, uh, this month. So, I mean, just looking back on the win, um, you know, were you happy with the performance? Did it go as you expected it to, that fight? So my opponent, uh, that fight wasn't uh, necessarily a title defense, but... Um, you know, Mari was a, a very experienced veteran. She has over 35 professional fights under her belt. And uh, the fight before that, um, you know, I was able to prove that uh, experience doesn't matter. So I wanted to make a bold statement for this fight going against a very experienced opponent. Um, I was able to get the win, but uh, I wasn't able to knock her down and I wasn't able to finish the fight. So for me, um, those are the things I have to work on and those are the things that I have to overcome in order to take my fight game to the next level. 
you know, always things that can be improved, but ultimately got the win. So, I mean, that's a big deal. That's what matters, right? And I mean, okay, maybe it wasn't a title defense, but I'll, correct me if I'm wrong. It was your first time main eventing for a Rebels event, right? So that's kind of a big deal. I mean, just what was the feeling like of getting to do that, you know, being the headliner? So, um, me being the main event, the last fight of the event, uh, it, didn't, it didn't really put too much pressure on me. I didn't really feel much. Um, my professional debut fight, uh, it wasn't necessarily the main event, but I was the last one to fight on that card. So it doesn't really mean too much. But I did, heading into that fight, I did feel like I needed to close the event in a very nice way. Obviously with a knockdown or with, you know, trying to finish the fight. So uh, I went in there with that mentality, but uh, yeah, I wasn't able to do that. So just yeah, I mean, you'll, you'll get them next time, right? So it's got to keep working and improving. But of course, like I said, got the win, everything. It's still a cool moment to be able to have that headlining spot, right? Um, and, you know, unfortunately, as we can see, you know, you got your hand wrap on. I know you injured your hand in the fight. Um, so just curious, what's the update there and the severity, you know, of, of your hand injury? How's it doing? Hi. I think I need my cast on for two weeks, um, but I want, I'm not allowed to close my fist at all. Um, basically, what happened is that the ligament that supports the joint muscle tore completely. So uh, I had to go, go under surgery and I had to stitch that, that ligament, particular ligament back up. So that's my injury. Um, I, I have this cast on for two weeks, but I can't close my fist. Um, so overall, uh, I'm told that it's going to take two months for me to start training, like hitting pads seriously. Uh, the plan is to start hitting pads <clears throat> in about a month with a soft glove and soft, soft pad. But uh, for me to go 100%, uh, it's gonna, probably going to take me two, two months. And I do believe that it happened in the second round. I dislocated my finger and continued to fight with that dislocated finger led to the tear. Wow. I mean, yeah, that doesn't sound very fun at all. <laughs> that sucks. But um, I mean, would you say that that's been the worst injury you've had so far? Because I mean, geez, the whole thing to the joint, that, that sounds brutal. <laughs> so I've had some broken bones in the past, but uh, injuring my right fist it is pretty uh it's pretty significant because you can't punch you can't really train yourself that allows any kind of uh, motions with your with your upper body or with your hands so right now um all i can do is just a lot of physical training uh and core strength and conditioning um and i try i'm trying to learn some uh, more techniques using my feet but that's you know that's all i can do for now but Really, I do want to fight as soon as possible. So my goal is to get back in the ring in, in about three months. Of course. I mean, it's as soon as you can when you're all healed up and everything. That would be great. And I mean, I, I know that you've kind of spoken a little bit about Ryzen before in the past and everything. You've hung out with some Ryzen fighters. I know Kana Watanabe, uh, you did the photo shoot with Kai Asakura, which was very cool to see. So, I mean, I'm just curious, was, you, was your hope kind of to win this fight and then maybe, you know, maybe get a fight on the big Ryzen New Year's Eve show? Was that something in your head <laughs> so in a perfect world i wanted to perform a good in a good way in my last fight so obviously uh, i wanted to perform in a more convincing way and ask for a spot but uh i couldn't do that during the fight so i i do feel that you know it, it could wait um i'll work on my skills again and hopefully i can uh, put on a more convincing fight and uh wait for my chance for next year I mean, just to talk about the last fight some more and, you know, with the injury and everything happening in the middle of the fight, right, the second round and still going on to win. I mean, does that kind of make it a little bit better and, you know, maybe, you know, give you that feeling of not, shouldn't be so hard on yourself because you did fight, you know, with essentially one hand, right? And then, I mean, it makes it more impressive that you were able to get through and still win with that injury, right? Is that, is you look, do you look at it that way at all? So I'm the kind of fighter who uh, gets in the fight mode and really don't feel things so i i do remember i do know when i hit my hand but a few seconds after that i don't really care i don't really feel it so i don't think i was fighting with one hand i think i was fighting with you know everything i had so i don't really take it 
I don't really think that I fought with an injured hand. So that's that's just how I fight. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. The adrenaline's going, and uh, it is what it is, right? You feel pain. Just it is. Just take it and keep going. Keep rolling. <laughs> so yeah, I get that. And I mean, you know, mentioning Ryzen, of course. If you can eventually make you know that dream come true of you know getting to be on a card, you know, essentially, if it was to be with kickboxing, you'd be the first, you know, presumably in the first kickboxing fight for females in Ryzen. But do you have any interest whatsoever in maybe you know trying MMA at some point, or is it you know we'll stick to the striking for now? Yeah, I'm not thinking about MMA at the moment because I know that MMA is not that easy of a sport and I'm not taking it lightly. So if I were to challenge MMA, I have to be the best at what I do and uh, I need to prove that I am the best at what I do for now and then challenge to MMA. So right now, I think my goal is to become a fighter known and a fighter to be desired to be able to fight in my rules on the Ryzen ring. So that's my goal for now. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a great mindset to have. You know, you, of course, you want to be your best at what you're already doing before maybe you try something new, accomplish all you can and, you know, kickboxing first and what have you. But I mean, I'd, I'm curious what you think, you know, having that perspective, you know, of, all right, I know how hard what I'm doing is. I know how hard, you know, MMA is and everything. But when you see fighters like, let's say, like Rena Kabota, you know, who's crossed over from shoot boxing and been, you know, successful in MMA as well, it is, what do you think when you see fighters who go from, you know, their striking backgrounds like yourself or whoever, and, you know, they go to MMA, is, is that inspire you at all to be like, man, I want to be like, do that someday, potentially, if, if it presents itself? So Rena is definitely inspiring. All I can just, she wows me every time, um, especially after the fact that she only trained like six months to, to a year before making the transition. Um, so she's very inspiring to me. But on the other hand, she's already accomplished everything in what she does. Uh, she's fought everybody. She doesn't have any more opponents. She doesn't have anything. She doesn't have any leftover business. So I think it was the right time for her to make that transition. Uh, but for me, there's so many, there's still so many opponents that I, I want to fight. There's so many, you know, beefs that I need to squash. So I do think that I have to, uh, do everything I can in what I what I do. And the thing is for me is whatever I compete in, in, in any sports, whatever I compete in, I always go for number one. I wanna be number one in the world, the best, best at what I do. So that's my mentality as of now. And uh, yeah, I don't, I'm not thinking of going to MMA at the moment. Yeah, I mean, I mean you know, the fighting, that you do inside the ring of course you know it affects things outside i would say as well because you know you become a pretty popular you know fighter i would say and you know just going to continue to grow your star power and everything as you continue to fight and you know have success and everything so i'm curious you know is it important for you to like be a good role model for you know the japanese people or young girls who want to get into uh you know fighting as well is that something you think about being a good role model or is it just uh you know it is what it is if it happens that's cool <laughs> So at first, I was just doing this because I like it. I was doing it for myself. But as my professional career grows, um, I do hear so many, you know, so many voices. The, the more the reality I, I, I run into is that women's kickboxing is not known whatsoever. Uh, I do think that I am the most... Uh, uh, I wouldn't say famous, but the most, uh, the, the fighter that makes the most noise, attention, in, in, in women's kickboxing. But the fact that I, I'm, only, I'm only a year and a half, maybe two years into my professional career, and a fighter with such a young career is taking the spotlight. I think there's an issue right there. So I, it's very disappointing to see the unpopularity and how not knowing women's kickboxing boxing is in Japan. It's, it's just very disappointing. So I think my goal is to, you know, make more, more noise and grab more attention on myself, which it eventually will, uh, will shed light to the entire women's kickboxing uh, scene. So right now my goal is to be that person to be desired and my existence will, I hope that my existence will force Ryzen to make, open up their women's kickboxing division so that I can fight 
in, in their big ring and get more exposure for the women who are all competing in kickboxing. Very well said. And, you know, it's, it's a very interesting thing, you know, being, yeah, you bring great, bring up great points, how, you know, the sport is still, you know, somebody's still pretty, pretty new, like yourself, pretty much carrying it a little bit, if it's fair to say. So, I mean, yeah, that's, that's a very good goal to have. I think it's something that would be, uh, you know, very cool to see it unfold before our eyes. So I'm um, wishing you the best with that, of course. And I mean, all right, I got two things left for you, Rena. And, you know, I'm curious, I've seen that you have a YouTube channel. Seems like something that's very fun that you get to do. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, what, uh, what made you want to start it, uh, your, your YouTube channel and, you know, something, something fun to do on the side? Um, so in Japan, it's, it's, it's as if all professional fighters have their own YouTube channel. And it's become a thing now. And uh, I've been watching many fighters' uh, videos and posts. And uh, as, as you watch them, it makes me feel, it make me feel, it makes me feel that I want to do this, I want to do that. And that desire began to grow. But usually I'm, I'm really busy and I, I don't have time to do that. But with the whole pandemic and the quarantine, that opened up some time slots for me to actually put things together so that gave me a good reason to start my youtube channel and uh, once you start it's it's fun i really enjoy it um i do all the filming and editing by myself and uh you know at the end of the day it turns into like an art the whole video that you created turns into an art so i feel like i'm being able to express myself in a different way uh, than i usually can so uh, i have been enjoying this uh quite a bit I could not agree more. And, uh, you know, the editing and putting everything together, it's definitely its own project in itself. I know exactly what that's like. <laughs> so uh, do you have uh, any favorite, any favorite people, fighters, maybe specifically that you like to watch on YouTube? <laughs> I think that the Asakura Brothers' channels, they, they're doing what they do is it's quite amazing. Good choices indeed. Good choices indeed. Very entertaining, those guys, <laughs> for their own reasons. Uh, but all right, last thing I'll leave you with here, Rena. You know, I know you've been on plenty of uh, Japanese game shows and, and talk shows and things like that. So I'm curious, is there been one specific kind of crazy game show experience that you've been on or something, you know, that stands out for, for maybe wackiness in terms of guest appearances that you've had? <laughs> hey, I think all the, uh, all the shows that I that are permitted, I attend, they're all fun. It's all fun, and I do have uh, great experiences with all of them. But uh, the thing that I, I enjoyed the most was uh, dressing up as a, uh, a maid costume. And uh, that was very fun, and I did enjoy it because I, I feel like being a maid is something exact opposite of my regular self. And uh, dressing up as a maid and just acting like one was definitely something that was very interesting. Um, I did enjoy it, so I might become a uh, cosplayer in in the near near future. There we go. Yeah, I mean <laughs> the maid video that was the one with uh, with Kana Watanabe, right? That was pretty funny seeing you guys like work out and the the maid outfits and you know, holding pads for each other. That was uh, definitely an entertaining one. So good choice there. Very cool. Very cool. But uh, yeah, that's all I got for you, Rena. Um, you know, thank you so much you know, for taking the time to chat here was awesome. I was very excited to talk to you. I know it's a big arigato gozaimashita. Congratulations again on your win. And, uh, you know, I wish you a quick, speedy recovery on the hand. Hope ever, no complications going forward. And uh, can't wait to see what's next for you. Just thank you so much. Next up is rising featherweight prospect, Kyohei Hagiwara. All right. Thank you for joining me, Kyohei. Great to see you, man. Congratulations on the very quick and impressive win in your last fight. That was absolutely filthy stuff, man. So, uh, yeah, thanks so much for joining me here. And I got to know, you must have been dying to fight again this year because three already, and you got four coming up, man. You're just itching to get back in there this year. Yeah, this will be a fourth fight in Ryzen, but uh, I've been used to fighting frequently during my, you know, my underground fighting days. So... It's just an everyday thing. It's pretty normal for me. And uh, so fighting a lot outside where the people are watching, it's become a... I am exposing my normal everyday life to the people. So it's nothing different for me. 
you mentioned the underground fighting right there. And, you know, for a lot of people who don't know, I mean, how early did you start underground fighting, actually? Like, when your actual fighting career began, like, how early was it? <laughs> so I've been fighting uh, underground since 17 years old. I've probably fought there for five or six years. I think I have over 20 fights uh, underground fights. All right, yeah, that's plenty. And you know, starting starting as young as you can, right? So very cool there. And you know, as for that rise of twenty five knockout, though the twenty twenty two seconds, I mean, how does that stack up? You know, with your best wins, because a good one, a very good one, highlight reel finish, and quick, obviously. So where does that rank among your best wins? Would you say? Yeah. So that that fight, that finish was definitely my uh, my number one performance throughout my career um, yeah and i mean just how good does it feel to you know not only beat somebody that quickly and impressively but you know you also beat a very experienced opponent like uchimura so fighting against a, a veteran obviously on paper he was a much much better opponent uh, better fighter than me on paper so uh being able to fight such a such a veteran of the sport in my backyard, in my in my hometown, in front of all my buddies, you can't beat that feeling. Yeah, that sounds like the dream right there, man. So a great experience, you know, for you, of course. And it was awesome to watch, like I said. And I mean, just as a fighter, though, do you actually ever imagine getting a knockout that quickly? Is that actually something you ever, like, think about? <laughs> I think specifically for this fight, um, because of how my opponent's style is, I kind of had an idea of this fight being uh, ending quickly. And uh, right before the walkout, I had this image of how to fight him and how to finish him. So I think this fight in particular, I got everything down as I planned in my head. Yeah, I mean, it went very well then. You can kind of see the future if that was the case. So <laughs> it worked out, man. And, and, you know, also that same night, it was just a big night for your division overall because, you know, crowned a champion for the first time, Saito o over Mikuru. Just curious, you know, all your thoughts on that fight in the main event and, you know, what you think of the new champion? Mm -hmm. um, my first thought was it was a very fun fight. And it was a very interesting fight. Um, and uh, I think that if I work on my ground game, which is my weak part, um, if I work on my ground hard enough, I'll be able to get to that level very soon. Yeah, I mean, you already got great striking, so it's like just got to take the whole game to the next level, right? And I mean, taking on Ren Hiramoto in your next fight, of course, on New Year's Eve, you know, he's a striker, so you might not have to worry too much about the grappling in this one. But, uh, you know, just how much do you know about Hiramoto going into this matchup besides... Of course, that he is a striker. So the only thing I know about Hiramoto at, the, at this point is that he's a striker. I haven't really studied him. I haven't really seen any of his fights. So everything moving forward, I'm going to have to watch his fights and study him. So, but as of right now, I just I don't know anything about him except he's a striker. Yeah, fair enough, man. Appreciate the honesty. <laughs> That's all I can ask for. So, I mean, with that in mind, you know, he's very young as well. I think he's 22. You know, you're both very young talented strikers so pretty it's safe to assume that this will be you know a pretty wild fight and it might not need the judges is that fair to say there's definitely no need for the judges for this fight <clears throat> someone's going down and i think it's going to be him but this fight will definitely end by a ko it's going to be a good one that's for sure expect the fireworks i would say and and you know just it's on the new year's eve show big rise in new year's eve show first time going to be a part of that man i mean how exciting is that for you? So simply, I'm very happy to be fighting on the New Year's Eve event. As a matter of fact, a year ago on New Year's Eve, I was watching the Ryzen event on television. And I didn't even think about me fighting on this platform a year from now, uh, a year later. So in that sense, I'm very excited and very uh, honored. I'm kind of perplexed in a way. I can't believe it's actually happening. But I do also understand that only very limited amount of fighters can can fight on that platform on New Year's Eve. So I'm going to, uh, I understand that very well. So I'll make sure to perform in a way so that people uh, know that I deserve to be in that ring. Yeah, I mean, you have so far. So I think, you know, you've earned it with these performances you're putting on, man. And I mean, 
do you feel kind of like most opponents are going to really try to just out grapple you because of how good of a striker you are until you like show that, you know, you want to grapple a little bit too. Is it, is it kind of that point with you where, you know, you're such a good striker that people are always going to try and take you down? So that's one of the things that I do expect if I continue to fight at this level. So I've been, I've been uh, training at a very famous uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner's place and he's been teaching me a lot of good things and i've been learning a lot of good things so um a little more time give me more time and uh i'll be able to have my you know ground defense and my submission skills and technique school technique will be up there so even at this point i i feel less concerned than i was uh six months ago in terms of the ground game yeah i mean just getting better every day you know making improvements as they come and you mentioned the jiu-jitsu coach there uh, who you're working with. Is, is that a secret or, or, or can you tell us who it is? <laughs> so I'm not quite sure about the details, but uh, his, his, his last name is Mr. Iwasaki. He's, uh, he's fought in Quintet and everything. So he's, a, he's a well-respected practitioner. All right, very nice. Very nice. Sounds like a good guy to have in the corner, of course. All right, two, two last things here for you, Kyohei, as we get wrapping up. Um, you know, you got so many great tattoos, man. So I'm very curious, you know, are they just kind of for the art look? You like how they look? Or you got some, some stories behind them, I would imagine. There's so many and they're all very detailed. Um, so so the, the tattoo on my chest is something that uh, I, do, I do have feelings for. Uh, it's, I put this one in when my best friend passed away back in the day. So it's, uh, it's more of a an homage for, for my best friend. So the one in my chest is something that I really want to have special feelings for. Mm, well, I'm sorry for the lost man, but that's a great gesture, of course. And uh, it looks very good. And I mean, was that the first one you got? Yeah, I started off with my right arm. And uh, I think I got my chest done last year. But I started everything from my right arm. See, I see. Very cool. Very cool, man. Well, I will leave you this one last thing here, Kyohei. Um, you know, I know that you, you know, like to do some snowboarding and baseball, at least from what I've seen on your Instagram and everything. So I'm curious, you know, what are some of your favorite, you know, things to do outside of fighting? So I like to, uh, I like, I like to do tattoos. I like to put in tattoos and I also like to ride my bike, my motorcycle. And, uh, during the winter times, I like to go snowboarding. I like to, uh, pick activities during the uh, during the four seasons so uh, yes i do like to stay active of course man and i mean have you ever tried skiing before i'm one of those people who snowboard or nothing else i, I don't even want to try with the, <laughs> the skis I've, I've never done skiing it's snowboard or nothing Yep. There we go. Good man. <laughs> Good man. <laughs> so, I will leave you with that, Kyohei. Uh, you know, appreciate the time so much, man. See you're traveling here. So appreciate, you know, taking the time. Um, and you look forward to the big fight and everything. Congratulations on the last fight. An awesome victory. And, uh, you know, look forward to seeing it on New Year's Eve. Thank you so much. Arigato gozaimashita. Hi. Yeah, I'll, put up, I'll put on the best fight of the night. And last but not least, we have the former Ryzen and Bellator bantamweight king, Kyoji Horiguchi. All right. Well, thanks so much for joining me, Kyoji. Awesome to get to see you, man. Welcome back, first of all. You know, just happy to have you here. And I got to know right away, were, were you still able to fish while you were recovering? Or was that something you had to really just, you know, struggle without for a little bit? <laughs> yeah, I was fishing on a regular basis. It was only a short period of time where I couldn't walk. So once I was able to kind of walk around I was I was out fishing very nice of course got to get out there and catch him when you can right so very cool to hear and I mean of course I know you've probably been you know talking about the injury a whole bunch because you know it's the most recent thing that's happened everything but you know I'm curious too just because I've heard you know mixed things about if it happened during the fight or if you had it going into the fight so I mean just tell me you know exactly you know, when when the injury happened first of all and like yeah was it during the fight or just before really the beginning of last year i i already had some uh, i was feeling some issues with my knee and my lower back 
but uh, I didn't really take it too seriously. Then I was practicing with a bum knee and a bum back. And uh, eventually, uh, during, during practice, it, it gave up. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, it's kind of weird, right? Because when you're, it doesn't feel too bad, right? And then it just kind of goes one day, right? So, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine. Could you ever have imagined a situation where like, all right, maybe I should fix this before something happens? Or is that something you even think about? Because you're like, well, I'm still capable of fighting. You know, it's not stopping me completely. But yeah, is that ever something that goes through like a fighter's mind where they're like, all right, maybe I should go figure out exactly what's going on with me before it gets too bad? <laughs> so overall, I had the mentality of I could, I could probably get through this and that was my overall mentality but i did feel you know it, it did feel weird so when i when i would come to japan i would visit some doctors and get it checked out but overall i i thought i could get over it yeah i mean of course you never want to take really any big breaks and especially for something like acl that's one that just takes some time in general um and you know does that did that make it harder too, having to have a layoff especially after you know the loss that you suffered <laughs> yeah, I, I looked at it as, as a good time to, to rest. Yeah. yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, you were on a hot streak there for a minute, just going, going, going. So yeah, eventually, good to take a little break, whether <laughs> injury or not. So for sure. And I mean, looking back at it all, do you feel like, you know, for that Kai fight specifically, do you feel like maybe you didn't take him as seriously as you should have just because, you know, it wasn't a title fight? I don't know. How do you look at it in hindsight with, you know, the layoff and how it played out, just everything looking back on it? It wasn't that I was taking him seriously, but it was more so of my conditioning wasn't 100%. I wasn't maintaining my body, which led me to not being able to prepare properly for this fight. So that's, I think that's what did everything for me. To look at it like in a positive mindset, right? I mean, do you feel like it kind of, you know, having that loss maybe relieved some pressure of having, you know, this long win streak that you had, you know, the pressure builds up, I'm sure, where you're like, oh, man, he's never going to lose now. So, I mean, having that snapped, does it feel like it relieved some pressure or maybe does it add pressure now going into this rematch because people want to be like, oh, the loss was a fluke. All your fans are like, let's show him it was a fluke. So, is it add pressure? Does it take, did it take away pressure or maybe add some? <laughs> like how, do you, how do you feel about it? So in general, I don't really feel pressure heading into a fight at all. So, um, so, so that in, in that terms, I, I don't feel too much pressure. Um, I'm just, I, I just go in there and prepare myself for the opponent who I'm going to be fighting, and, uh, and that's it. But as, as for the New Year's Eve fight, I know it's going to be a fun fight with a lot of action for sure. Yeah, and I mean, you know, returning for just in time for the New Year's Eve show and, you know, being, you know, the top billing and everything. Is that a good feeling to be like, all right, coming right back, get you really excited to be in that spot right away? Yeah, so fighting on New Year's Eve definitely feels some special. It's, it's got that special feeling. And uh, I've always had, I've had my target set to be back on New Year's Eve. So I think uh, everything is on, on, on schedule. Yeah, great timing indeed. And, you know, you fought on New Year's Eve shows before and everything. And, you know, just huge deals, I think. Probably the most fun part of the MMA calendar, just because we always know it's coming and it's always big. So, I mean, having been, you know, yourself in a UFC title fight, which I think is another thing you can compare, can compare to, like, the biggest moments in the sport that fighters can be a part of. UFC title fight, a big rise in New Year's Eve show, just all the fans screaming and everything, the big atmosphere. Does one feel like bigger than the other? Or how do you just compare the two of being in those moments? For me, it, it really doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference because what you're doing is the same thing. You're doing the same thing inside a different platform on different dates. Um, obviously, depending on a fighter, you know, each fighter feels differently and they will probably take that experience differently. But for me, it's not too different it's the same thing stone cold kyoji then right just doesn't get affected by uh, by what's going on around him perfect <laughs> so, and you know of course to go back to kai and everything he's fought i believe it's four times you know since you guys fought the first time and i mean you know plenty of great performances you know he had the loss mixed in there but just what have you thought of 
kind of his progression and his performances since you guys last fought. Well, so was, man. Ma, ma. Yes, I think his uh, variations in striking has uh, has improved. Um, he's able to mix in some takedowns uh, within the whole uh, within the exchange. So I think overall he's developing uh, as as a overall he's developing. Yeah, hard to deny. He's been looking good, and I just can't wait for the rematch coming up here. Um, and you know, I, I did mention that he did have the loss, so I'm curious. You know, it was to Manel Cape, you know, who became the champion, and then went on to the UFC. Now you've been in the UFC, you fought Cape, you beat Cape. I'm just curious, you know, how do you think that he will do in the UFC now, Manel Cape? Yeah, my wrestling. I think he needs to work on his wrestling more to be able to leave some good results in the UFC, but. Uh, I can't deny the fact that he's probably going to put out some exciting fights. Yeah, definitely. It's going to be very interesting to see. And he'll be dropping to flyweight too. You know, he's normally been fighting at bantamweight. So do you think that gives him better chances of doing good or is it doesn't make a difference on the weight? I, th- I think uh, Manel's a, he's a pretty big guy. And uh, so I think the weight cut's going to gonna affect him pretty well. But... Uh, that, that's my thought. I mean, it, it all depends on that weight cut because he's a big guy. Yeah, of course, of course. I mean, last thing about UFC stuff, but, you know, I'm curious since, you know, recently everything, Davison Figueredo, the new champion, has come on. I'm sure you've seen a little bit of him. Just curious, you know, your thoughts on him. And, you know, is he legit? Is he the next Demetrius? People are really high on this guy. Just what do you think of uh, Figueredo so far? So he's had some fantastic performances, and he's, uh, he's, able to, he's been able to finish the fight in the early rounds. So he's got the capability to fight, which is really, I mean, to finish the fight, which is a really good thing. But I would be interested to see him fight in the, the later rounds, like the championship rounds. So that's something I would like to see. Yeah, that's a great point. We haven't seen him go there yet. So uh, I have to wait and see if somebody can take him there. That's the exciting part about everything. And uh, his next fight should be a very good too coming up here, turning around quickly. But um, as for you, of course, more back to <laughs> the Kyoji side of things and, you know, the Kai Asakura rematch coming up. Do you think that, you know, Kai, since, you know, since he won against you and then has been become champion now, his star power, I feel like, has improved. He's becoming, you know, a really big superstar in his own right. Do you feel like this is a fight where, you know, of course, you assume you're going to win. If you get the win, that we could see a trilogy down the line or we, we're not going to think too far ahead. Is that possible, you think? <laughs> um, so, yeah, it's, it's definitely a possibility. I mean, if I beat him in New Year's Eve and if he wants to fight, if he wants another rematch... I mean, I think I should give it to him. So yeah, for sure. We'll see what happens, right? Let's let's worry about the, the next one first. Um, yeah. <laughs> but of course, I also wanted to talk about your your wins over Darian Caldwell, Kyoji, where you became you know defended your you won the championship, the Ryzen Championship, and then took his Bellator title. You know, both crazy moments, really cool achievements for you and everything. You know, the first one, big comeback. You know, it looked like you were kind of down on the scorecards, and they caught him with the guillotine there at the very end. Big comeback. And then the second one, obviously, you won your second promotional title to, to hold two at the same time. I mean, which one would you say meant more to you, you know, if, if you could pick one? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the Ryzen belt meant more for me. Fair enough, fair enough. It was, it was a very good moment indeed. So I was <laughs> just, just curious there. Because they were both good wins, of course. But, um, you know, Kyoji, it was interesting, man, you know, because you started really turning into like a serious knockout artist once you got to Ryzen and everything. So was there like something specifically that you would say kind of changed when you went from the UFC to Ryzen that made you take this step up to this next level and go on your crazy winning streak, whether it was like returning to Bantamweight or some training changes or just, just anything specific? So I think there's two aspects to why uh, I was able to finish fights. Is one is because I uh, I went up a weight class. That's definitely a factor. And the second factor is that I, I've changed my fighting style to finishing fights instead of winning fights. So I think that's the biggest factor for me in able, for me to be uh, able to finish fights. Yeah, definitely. I mean, instead of fighting for the win, kind of fighting for the finish and going for the kill more and... Uh, Oh, you're good at both, obviously, so I can kind of take your pick there, and it's working out. Um, and, you know, just to get close to wrapping up here, Kyoji. You know, I remember hearing the story from, from Kayla Harrison, you know, one of your training partners at ATT, 
when she was talking about uh, <laughs> the story where you would call her like the big strong girl and she got mad at you. <laughs> I'm just curious. Uh, what's it like training with Caleb? Because obviously, you know, I'm sure you guys have a lot of fun and everything, but incredible judoka and, you know, turning into a very good MMA fighter. Just what's it like, you know, training with somebody like her and, well, of course, all the fun I'm sure you guys have. <laughs> So Caleb, Caleb's a very funny person, and uh, she, she talks a lot, and uh, she almost talks too much. So when we describe, when I describe us training, it's more like we, we joke around and mess around more than we train seriously. I mean, obviously, we do, we do train seriously when we have to, but it's mostly a lot of messing around. Nice. I mean, hey, whatever works. <laughs> Sounds like a good time. <laughs> ATT right there. <laughs> good fun. <laughs> but, uh, all right. Two, two things left for you, Kyoji, man. I, I was very curious about this because, you know, I noticed that you used to have what two nicknames or, or the Supernova and Typhoon. You know, correct me if I'm wrong here, but if those were nicknames, curious about the story behind them because you're not using them anymore. So how did, how did you, these come to be, these nicknames? Supernova, <laughs> you What's what's a supernova? It's uh it's when a sun explodes, I believe. Oh. I I actually had no idea that I was called <laughs> called that. <laughs> hey, the more you know. <laughs> internet internet nicknames, man, they're crazy. I've <laughs> multiple situations where fighters are just like I, I have no idea where that came from so yeah see i had to get to the bottom of this so thank you you gave me that's a good answer because you didn't know <laughs> yeah i didn't know <laughs> <laughs> that's, hilarious. that's awesome <laughs> all right kyoji last thing i will leave you with man thanks again for the time and everything but i asked jury ohara this because he's a big fisherman too don't know if you you know know jury or fish with him very much at all but you know i asked him what his biggest fish was that he caught uh, so I got to ask what yours is, man. I'm sure you've got some big ones. <laughs> so I think the biggest catch is that when uh, uh, the ATT owner, Dan Lambert, he took us out uh, fishing uh, to a different country. I don't remember where we went, but he took us out. Uh, Kayla was there too. Uh, we all went fishing. And uh, at that time, I caught a big uh, swordfish. And I don't know the exact size, but it was definitely bigger than me. So that's, that's my biggest. know. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Very cool. Team team fishing trip there. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Very cool, man. Very cool. Well, all right. Well, that's all I got for you, Kyoji. This was awesome, man. Thanks so much, you know, for taking thank the time. You. I know you're very popular, man. Very busy. So a uh, big arigato gozaimashita, you know. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Very excited for the big fight. Oh, it's going to be great. Um, New Year's Eve. Happy to see you back and healthy and everything. So, uh, you know, good luck with the rest of training and everything. And, uh, you know, we'll see you at New Year's. Thank you so much, sir. Yep. Thank you so much. Dude, I remember, oh, just to talk about Manoa, man. Uh, probably for me the gnarliest submission that i have ever seen was he he pulled off and t tell me if you know where i'm going with this but let's see if i can find who it was against i don't remember uh, he beat uh, sokuju no what was his name it was it was like some russian prospect what was his name ah here it is that's not Russian, maybe. But Goran Jettingstad, when he did the the lateral knee bar and dislocated his hip, that was I. That one makes me cringe so badly. <laughs> Have you Dude, seen I that? I don't remember that all. Dude, one. Let me send it to you right now because <laughs> it is. He, he dislocated his opponent's hip. Yeah. Wait, does it like look nasty? Oh yeah, it's horrible. <laughs> I don't know if I want to watch it, dude. <laughs> like, like the guy obviously had no idea what was happening to him, right? And I mean, it's it's the only time I've seen that one. But yeah, it's like it's kind of it's mean of him to do that because <laughs> oh, it's it's bad. Here, I'm gonna send it to you. <laughs> I don't think I'm gonna watch it, dude. I cringe worthy worthy things are not fun yeah. to watch. Oh. Well, 
it's right there if you want to. <laughs> but yeah, I just if I uh, tech, uh, Twitter or no, email? I put it here in the Zoom. Oh, oh man, no, <laughs> no, 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 not like on video. I put the link in there. <laughs> no, I know, I know. <laughs> but now I'm gonna have to watch. It. Yeah. Was this in Dream? I think no. No, no. this uh, IGF. This is you know. Oh, 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 damn. Oh. Dude, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I did not need to see that. Oh. <laughs> Poor dude, he didn't he didn't he even looked like he didn't even deserve to be in there. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't think he had that many fights. No, he's I looked him up on Tapology, he's 0 and 1. That was his only fight. <laughs> Makes it even worse. Oh my god. Oh, that's so bad. <laughs> like, yeah, that's that's just mean to do. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I I've mean, never seen that. I mean, I don't think you know, I'm meant to do it. I think it just happened. But when like, he, like, like he went to actually do a knee bar, but it just yeah, hook, it just hooked onto the ankle. <laughs> Maybe it was the leverage. It was too long. Yeah. Uh, his, his his limbs were too long, and Minoa you know, man was too short. So it dislocated before he went into full, full <laughs> cranking mode. Uh, either way, that one that one's probably my least favorite. <laughs> I guess my whole... favorite is uh, Al- Aoki's Wizard. Have you seen that one? Who? Maybe. Back in Shuto. Let's see. He knew what he was going to do. He knew exactly what was going to happen, and he did it anyways. This wasn't when he flipped off the guy, right? That was an armbar. No, this was, no, this was way before. Okay. It was some Russian dude. It was some <laughs> Russian dude in Shuto. <laughs> you know we're going to have to put these on the episode now, our reactions to these. <laughs> Aoki Wizard. A wizard too. It's like not even typically a submission. <laughs> she just yanked it. Yeah, it's. I'm scared a little bit. <laughs> I'm gonna show you this. I'm not gonna watch it because this is. It makes me like. That's fair. I didn't. I didn't watch the other one. I just said you so. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> here, here, here's the Aoki one. All right, we will get my reaction here too. The Aoki wizard. It's just mean. Yeah. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah, that was definitely. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> who can do that? Wow. That's, That's kind of crazy. That's a mean ass move, right? <laughs> yeah. I I need to see that again actually. <laughs> that was just so disturbing. Just got I got it. He had the arm. Oh, rate. you can hear it too. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> that's that is wow i have never seen anything like that <laughs> because nobody does it i mean he set it up weird too though like yeah that was <laughs> he knew exactly where the arm was and where his body was and he knew that enough force would pop it like oh he, yeah oh my it, God. <laughs> that was something totally different than like an anderson leg kick or checking a leg kick it's totally different right <laughs> Well, he give, he doesn't even give him the chance to, for a tap in that situation. Correct, correct. He goes for the instant break. For I mean, for the uh, the one where he flipped the opponent off, he gave the opponent a chance to tap, right? Yeah, I think he did too. Boom, break. So it's it's really disturbing. Wow. Yeah, that yeah. was wild. I can't, I can't believe you haven't seen that one yet. <laughs> I don't know how I haven't. <laughs> wow. Now you know, right? That's something yeah. to talk about. I know. That, uh, I just can't even imagine. Yeah, that one's going to bother you for a while, dude. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you went for seconds. God. I know. <laughs> Let's see. What are some other ones? No. <laughs> uh, I mean... Well, okay, we've all seen this one, so we don't need to watch it again. But the the Shogun and uh, Mark Coleman first fight, yeah, yeah, they take down the leg, right? That was his arm. He, he just went to natural, put his arm down on the takedown, and 
Ouch, ouch. Yeah, yeah, was bad. Those are bad, too. <laughs> or, uh, of course, the classic Sakuraba, Henzo Gracie. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So ridiculous. So, yeah, I wanted to point out, you know, before we did fan questions, you know, we did speak to Kanako Murata after her UFC debut, successful UFC debut, of course. You guys could see that on my channel, where we are now, youtube.com slash Drake Riggs. And it's going to look a little bit funny on video, but, you know, we did speak to Kanako, right? You know, you know what really caught me and that I thought was interesting is that when you asked uh, <clears throat> the whole experience about the UFC, you know, coming from Ryzen and Victa, um, she didn't care at all. Like what I got from her answers was that it was just another fight. She didn't care about the experience because me as being, being a promoter and knowing all operations, like the UFC, they do an amazing job with their operations. Yeah. They spend so much money. <clears throat> they send out limousines to pick up fighters. Yeah. And everywhere fighters go, they're treated like superstars and, with everything, they're so anal about everything, especially with the COVID, right? Yeah. Test three, everything is on point, super professionally organized. And, you know, like from my point of view, I would be like, holy shit, this is amazing. The, the, you know, the UFC, of course, they know what they're doing. They're cream of the crop. But none of those options or opinions came to Kanako's mind. Mm-hmm. She was worried about one contracting the virus and not being able to fight and two she had a translator in vegas that's 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 all what came to mind <laughs> yeah. right the limousines the whole the whole performance institute they they, they give you food right yeah <laughs> they, gave her, they gave her like three packed meals for her weight cut they do everything and everything is handled professionally tip top and she had nothing to say about that yeah that is funny <laughs> just shows where her competitive mind is like for her it's a fight she's there to fight and that's what she wants to do she doesn't she could care less about operations i guess yeah and i mean she didn't even seem that happy with the performance either i thought it was amazing (laughs) just her her mindset as a competitor is 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 pretty amazing yeah because i was expecting well the ufc is great everything you know they came they came Pick me up in a limousine. They have they had pre picked pre cooked meals for me. Delivered mm. everything was good. None of that came. To yep. <laughs> oh. It's amazing that like that mentality is strong. Yeah, she's a competitor. Sure. I mean, like, well, I mean, Yuri was more positive talking about. It. I mean, he didn't mention that stuff, but like. He pointed out, I know you saw it, but pointed out more of the, like, the uh, the spectacle, I guess, of Ryzen in comparison. So yeah, I mean, that's I something think, I thought she would have mentioned, you know? <laughs> like, less, I like I liked the quote from Erie, less show, more competition, I go straight to the cage. Mm-hmm. That's totally his mentality. Yeah. It was like, it, it was good. It was good to experience the show, but me from my level of competition is now just straight fighting Mm -hmm. which is damn you know that's that's totally his mindset yeah i mean it's it's not gonna get it's not gonna get that much bigger of a feel (laughs) you know for Mm -hmm. uh, at least i wouldn't think so for him in the ufc especially right now (laughs) yeah Yeah. oh awesome some making waves we'll see how cape does coming up here how he handles it all right, time again for fan questions, everybody. Thank you to the two. We just got two this week, this time around. So uh, that's all good, but appreciate them as always, you guys. So let's kick it off here. Zane Bando, at Zane Bando 99, my colleague at Fansided. Thank you, sir, for putting one in here. And it is quite, quite a loaded one, I would say. Very many possibilities to it. Um, so Zane asks, what is the biggest fight Ryzen can make in 2021? And that, you know many possibilities for that and especially some unknowns with how long the crazy quarantine stuff will all last but um yeah i had to think about this one a little bit and try to be realistic with it um and my mind just kept going to you know and i brought it up to horiguchi but you know that possible trilogy fight between him and kai i mean 
that's the first thing that comes to mind without bringing in somebody from like, let's say Bellator to make another, you know, massive champion versus champion fight. Like it sounds like from what I've heard that Patricio Pitbull is interested in, you know, following his brother's footsteps a little bit to, you know, get in the rise and ring at some point. I mean, that would be massive no matter who he fights. But um, as for straight up what Ryze can work with right now, biggest fight, I mean, the, this rematch already feels huge to me. And I mean, the, it, was, it, was ba- it was coming off of arguably the greatest upset ever, in my opinion. If you look at where Kai was at in his career right there, that upset was absolutely nuts. Um, nobody saw that coming. Um, and then if Ko- Horiguchi gets the win back here, reclaims his title, setting up the trilogy fight down the line, I mean... I think that would just make it that much bigger potentially. So that seems like the obvious answer, but of course we need to see if Kai, if Kai wins again, then that's probably out of the question. Right. So I don't know. That's where my mind goes. Um, you, you probably got a better thought process here for this one, but uh, what would you say Shingo? Obviously many moving parts. Yeah, definitely. Uh, many moving parts, many possibilities. Um, I would say if the whole pandemic thing continues and we cannot resolve the international travel things like <clears throat> even for this uh new year's eve we've kind of figured out a way how we can bring in a limited amount of international fighters uh to fight in japan but obviously it's going to require a lot more time it's going to take up a lot more a lot of more of their time um they're gonna have to be committing committing to coming to japan for a lot longer so a lot of you know a lot of things need to be agreed on but it's still possible to a limited amount of fighters, but obviously we can't bring in ten or twenty like what well, like we used to, yeah. because the expense is just gonna just gonna kick our ass. <laughs> but um, so in those terms, yes, there are po- possibilities. But let's just stay focused with uh, domestic fighters, right? Um, the trilogy is definitely one fight that could make sense. Um, but uh, I I think I'm leaning not I, but we're we're leaning more towards of. You know, just like a, a a Grand Prix within Japanese fighters. Like we have enough talent in the bantamweight division. We have enough talent in the featherweight division now. Maybe the lightweight division, but I think oh, even a super bantamweight division. I think we can do something um, that makes sense, and we can we we have enough talent. We have we've built enough stories in each division now, so that we can probably hold a domestic Grand Prix and keep the story going within, within the country, within, within the fighters who we have. Um, you know, there's certain, there's still a lot of other domestic fighters that haven't fought in Ryzen yet. So there could be new additions, new stories to be added. So, you know, in terms of just, uh, not thinking about just a single fight, but I think a division Grand Prix would be interesting and that would be something that makes the most sense. Yeah, no, those would always be awesome no matter what the outcomes. So I think that is a great point there. And I mean, I guess if we want to get real wild too, let's let's imagine the storyline of, let's say, I guess we would have to assume that Kai loses twice to Horiguchi or whatever, but then imagine he goes up to try and avenge Mikuru and take on Saito or something crazy. <laughs> so, yeah. You never know. You never know, you guys. So uh, yeah, very good question from Zane. A lot of good possibilities. They're excited to see what 2021 has for us. Hopefully less COVID. <laughs> That's the main thing that I'm concerned about. But um, yeah, many options, of course. All right, moving on to the second and final one. This episode, you guys, from at King CO Jr., a you know past asker. So thank you, sir, for submitting another question. He asks, New Year's Eve announced matchup. Hideo Takoro has a history of the cross-sport rookie fights with Ursan Yamamoto, uh, Kazayaman Saiga, Kazuhisa, Kazuhisa Watanabe, and now Shinobu Ota. Ota is a blue chip Olympic silver medalist crossover. Do you think these matchups derail careers with too much too soon? So I think, I mean, they can a little bit, but I mean, this is Ota's debut. So I don't know if I would say that's, that it's definitely too much too soon to see if he would be derailed from just one fight in his debut and everything. But um, at the same time, you got to start somewhere. If this guy's as good as he is, we'll find out right away, right? So there's definitely two sides to look at that. And it just really kind of depends on the outcome of what happens. Cause we haven't even seen Ota yet. Like these other guys you're talking about, I mean, you know, we've, we've seen a little bit more from them. So um, yeah, I, I think that there's arguments for both sides there to not give an exact answer. I'm sorry, King Zio, but that's just how I feel about it. Yeah. There's a, 
there's two ways to look at it, right? When you have these Olympic wrestlers, like these elite level athletes, like there's two ways to start. Like one, you put them against the Joe Schmo, right? Absolute tomato can and make them, make them look great. That's, that's one way to do it. Um, but again, it, it's, there's really no credibility to it, right? You can only, you can only hype up so much of, of your regular John, John Smith. And uh, now maybe back in the day that would have worked because uh, the information was limited. There's only so much out there, but now these days, like you can bring in somebody from Madagascar and people have footage on them, right? People have information on them, but probably know his freaking address by the time you, <laughs> you know, so it's just really hard to, do that type of matchmaking these days, I would say. So, you know, why not put him against uh, a veteran of the sport? You know, it's uh, <clears throat> the good thing about Tokoro san is that he always puts on a good fight. When you look at the Urson fight, when you look at the Kazuhisa Watanabe fight, you know, those are all, they all turned out to be good fights. And Tokoro, actually, they were all comebacks, right? Against Urson, he got knocked down. He was, he was getting beat in his hands. <clears throat> And then he, you know, came back with that, uh, that slick arm bar. Kazuhisa Watanabe, he was getting peppered on his feet. So Takoro-san is a veteran of the sport, but he's always, his fights are always so good. And he puts on fights where both fighters don't lose. Like nobody loses when he fights. The result, yes, there's a win and a lose, but overall as branding and as an impression, as an, as an impression for the athlete, nobody loses because Tokoro-san's fight style is that way. And he's got the credentials, he's got the experience enough to, to, you know, to overcome those, I don't know, I don't know how to say it, because he's not like physically monster, right? He's, yeah. He fights with naked heart. Mm-hmm. So, you know, this, this fight has the potential of being, being a really good fight as well. You know, the good thing about Tokoro-san is that he puts on a great fight against anybody. Yeah. This so, is- yeah, and... You know, and even even for that athlete, if he loses to Tokoro-san, I mean, that's okay. You know, Tokoro-san's a veteran of the sport, and he's you know he's a master at MMA. So it's something that both fighters can draw attention. It's not just one side. Both fighters can can draw attention, and it has a potential of being a really good fight. And I think you know this matchup. It I don't think nobody nobody loses in this fight either way. Yeah, no, I think you said that very well. And when you think about the actual, let's say, derailing of hype trains or people who are coming in from another sport, whatever it is, you know, you mentioned the tomato can route where you give them some guys that they totally obviously should beat for like, let's say their first three, four fights, however many, then you throw them to like a Takoro or whoever and just totally expose them. And it looks way worse than if you did that right away, right? Yeah. So, I mean... It's just uh, different ways to look at it. But yeah, I, I think that's uh, the best way. And, you know, you can't go wrong with a guy who's always putting on good shows and will bring it out of Ota, I'm sure. So yeah, I, I think when you look at uh, Kazuyuki Miyata, Miyata's career, mm-hmm. I, I think for his first four or five professional MMA fights, he went like one in four. Like his debut was against Kid Yamamoto. Mm-hmm. He lost two seconds. <laughs> right? But... The worst way you can lose. (laughs) So Miyata-san always talks about it that it worked out good for his career. That he was he already he was already exposed or not exposed, but he was experienced. He was brought into like the top talent in his earlier days. Although it didn't, you know, it it caused him uh, a lot of losses early Mm -hmm. early in his career. But he he fed off of that, and uh, he came back a lot stronger, and now he's one of the best featherweights that Japan's ever had. I mean, it, it creates kind of that, that need to maybe like adapt and evolve a little bit quicker than maybe they yeah. would have without doing that. And I mean, my mind went right to Miyu also, when you think about that Miyu Yamamoto, who, you know, came over with her fantastic wrestling background and had a really rough start to her career. But now she's clearly a top five Adam weight, despite being 46 years old. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, I think that those are two great examples there. And, I mean, yeah, and I think, and I think these athletes, they don't have too much time to compete too. When they mm-hmm. already they make the transition, they're already 
past their elite athletic prime. Yeah. I would say. You know, they're, they're pretty much living off of their, their deposit of their experience of what they've had as an athlete. So you can't really take wait four or five years for them to get experience. They need to ta- adapt, right? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's you know, like the thing with, with Rousey too. I mean, we, we all knew there was kind of the hourglass was ticking from the start because, you know, she had her knee issues and just from doing judo her whole life. Like, yeah, people forget that they've already had full careers, right? They're just coming to try something new and see if it works out. So, yeah, it's definitely uh, like you can't really wait. And, you know, especially with, you know, somebody like me who's <laughs> not very young, but still young in MMA and everything. But, yeah, there's just some, many different variables to it. So. Definitely. We will see. And uh, yeah, that is on Ryzen uh, 26, you guys, a New Year's Eve. And um, yeah, thank you so much to King CO 24 for the question. Zane, you know, thanks, buddy, for shooting in a question this time. Uh, good stuff from both of you guys. And, you know, always good stuff from everybody. Appreciate the questions. Appreciate the viewing, support, all that stuff. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Um, another good one, I would say very biased, of course, but, uh, yes, we were planning for episode six to drop before rising 26, of course, with, uh, plenty of fighters f- fighting on the card. And, um, yeah, just hope you enjoyed this one. Appreciate the support so much. You guys it means the world. Hope you enjoy every single episode and, uh, the Japanese version as well. will continue if you were curious and you've made it this far to the end, but, uh, <laughs> didn't know there was a Japanese version. There is one. So go check that out too. And uh, just thank you guys so much, and we will see you next time.